All right, hello everyone. My name is Paul Bohm, and I'm the founder of Teleport. I will talk to you today about how protocols will replace companies and why. Teleport is a ride-sharing app built on an open protocol that rewards early adopters. And as I go through this presentation, I will talk about each of these parts. Why a new ride-sharing app? Why built on an open protocol? And what is a protocol? What are open protocols? And why is it important to reward early adopters? But before I get to that, I will give you a little bit of background on myself and the journey that got me here. I grew up in Austria, but really, I was a total nerd, and I lived on the internet, and I went to hacker conference around the world to speak and to learn, so still doing pretty much the same thing as here in Breakpoint, hanging out with cool people who have similar hobbies. But back when I was in Austria, I didn't have much of a local community, and one day, I went to a hackerspace in Germany, in Berlin. I never heard about a hackerspace before. They had created a community space with a really cool backstory. They said, there is a space station buried underneath the city of Berlin, and the landmark antenna of the city of Berlin, TV tower antenna, was the antenna of the space station. And you can see a picture on the slides of that uh, community space. And people were teaching each other to solder, to work on hardware, to hack, to program. And I felt like a real community. It was something I wanted in my life back in Vienna, in my hometown of Vienna. And I wanted to start a hacker space, but I didn't know how, and I had no money. I barely could make rent. So being an idealist, I went out. I put together a flyer with some friends. I talked about this, and I gave people the vision of what I wanted to build. And I made a list, and I told people, look at this. If we share the cost, if each of us spent 20 euros a month, and we get 100 people, we can start a community space together. And of course, people told me, you're insane. You're never going to get 100 people. So I was like, well, there's not a lot of risk, right? You can just put your name on the list. I might not get 100 people, but if we get 100 people, we can build something together. And it worked. We got a really cool space right by the city hall, hundreds of members, a lot of activity, amazing projects starting there. In fact, the first uh, 3D printer was worked on by an artist in residence from New York who later on started a hackerspace in New York, Pre Pettis, the first consumer 3D printer, uh, in our hackerspace. Many more projects and startups came out of this, and it was really exciting. In fact, it worked so well that people around the world got inspired, and over a thousand hackerspaces around the world were started based on this idea. And of course, there's the question, why did this work? It seems very obvious, but it was important enough that in 1998, a cryptographer named Bruce Schneier, and I read this years later, I started this hackerspace in 2006. In 1998, he and another author wrote a paper called The Street Performer Protocol. Three years after us, Kickstarter turned the system, now known as a threshold pledge system, into a way to fundraise for projects. The big idea here is, if you can coordinate humans, even if you don't have money, you can achieve a lot of things. That was a monumental insight for me that would shape the rest of my life. Years later, I would fairly early on encounter a protocol that had a built-in coordination mechanism that would change the world in even bigger ways. And I will get to that, but first, what is a protocol? A protocol is a way of how one computer program talks to another computer program. So if your email program wants to send an email to someone, it says, your computer says to another computer, I want to send an email. If you want to access a website, it says, hey, send me that website. 
a protocol is open when there are many different programs doing the same thing. So you have many different email clients. They all work with each other. There are many different web browsers. They all work with each other. But not all protocols are open. Many companies created their own protocols, and they are closed. And because users of the internet in the early days were used to protocols being open, they believed the companies when they said, we're creating these closed protocols, but you can just treat us like we're an open protocol. We're going to be fair to the users. We allow third-party clients. You can just build on us as if we were an open protocol. But one by one, these companies went back on their promises, and the users learned that they can't trust the big companies to stay fair. Imagine a world without open protocols. If there was only one web browser, only one email client, only one payment app, those companies would be able to control a large portion of our lives. But that is almost the world we already live in. In fact, most applications that people use on a daily basis right now are controlled by a single company or maybe one or two companies or sometimes the government. The only place that is still open are email and the web, and maybe a few smaller outskirts. The world users want is open, like email, like the web. But for the longest time, centralization has only increased until one day someone by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto released a white paper 15 years ago, very recently, I think yesterday or two days ago, was the birthday of Bitcoin. And it made it possible to build decentralized protocols again. I'll get into what, is, what it takes to build a decentralized protocol that is successful in just a moment. But when I first learned about Bitcoin, I was a protocol engineer at Dropbox. And I built a protocol I'm really proud of there. It's the Dropbox Lansing protocol. It's the software that connects all the Dropbox desktop clients that are on the same network. And it's probably used by 100 million people. To my knowledge, it's never had a security problem. I'm extremely proud of it. But it's still a closed protocol. But it predisposed me to kind of understand what Bitcoin is capable of in allowing us to build decentralized protocols. So I wrote a blog post, Bitcoin's value is decentralization. This was in 2011. And a lot of people credit me to this day with getting them into crypto. Back then, it was Bitcoin, not crypto. And it got me into rooms I never thought I would be in and meet people I never thought I would meet. It was really exciting. And I think I captured something important with this that sometimes, if you don't want a central authority, you can build a protocol instead, and it can do the job of the central authority. So I called it Bitcoin's value is decentralization. But I missed the forest for the trees. Bitcoin did not only enable decentralization. It was an extremely potent coordination tool. Bitcoin acquired customers for free by building a movement. There was no marketing budget involved. And this was on my mind when I got into crypto. I joined a Bitcoin exchange. I did a bunch more things. I had various uh, ventures. I participated in things to grow the space. I tried to take crypto mainstream. But then one day, a couple of years ago, I got into, I was in Miami, and I wanted to go to the beach. And if you know Miami, Miami is by the water, but the beach is over a bridge in Miami Beach. So I called a car, a nice black car, got in with a rideshare app on my phone, and started talking to the driver. And halfway into the conversation with the driver, the driver was very chatty. He asked me, hey, so how much do you, how much do you pay? And I said, $64. And he was like, that's odd, because you know I'm only getting $16 from this ride. I was like, whoa, what's going on here? This is supposed to be a marketplace, right? 
when, you, when I'm paying more, the driver is also supposed to get more, right? It's a marketplace. We talk about marketplace companies. But as I started digging into this, I learned it's not a marketplace. It's a company that tries to charge the customer as much as possible and pay the driver as little as possible. It's a huge market. McKinsey estimates that by 2030, rideshare might be as much as 800 billion a year in revenue that's larger than Bitcoin today. The most conservative estimates I was able to find are 300 billion a year in revenue. Huge, huge market, but the drivers don't really get paid. There's no incentive for them to get paid. It's a monopoly, essentially. You might have one competitor in some markets, but as we know, if there's no open market where no one can, new can come in, there's coordination between these competitors, even if it's not explicit. So this does not work for the drivers, and it does not work for the riders either. Centralized rideshare is expensive. Uber spends most of their revenue acquiring new drivers. 33 billion in total, actually. What if the drivers and riders could invite each other, like Bitcoin did, with no marketing budget? Drivers earn more, riders pay less, if we create an open network for rideshare. But of course, if we do it, I'll get to that in one second. Uh, we created the rideshare protocol to achieve just that. Teleport is to the rideshare protocol just as Chrome is to the World Wide Web. So teleport is not the protocol. It's just the application that accesses it. And there will be many applications like teleport that, access, that can access the rideshare protocol. Trip is open. That means every role on the network can be fulfilled by many different entities. We already are licensed in two out of the three largest, most populous states in the United States with one rideshare operator. We have multiple external and internal people on unlocking more markets. There's verifiers which check the identities and create an identity system on top of Solana. Uh, we have compliance auditors in various roles. You can go into this in depth in our light paper on trip.dev. I'll get to that in a second. The important takeaway here is TRIP is safe and secure because we do all the same checks, we have all the same regulation, all the same licensing as existing rideshare, except it is much better for the drivers and riders. TRIP.dev is where you can learn about this. Now, this is great. You have a protocol that's open, that's fair. It's a real market with competing operators that set the price, so it is actually fair. But how do you get from here to there? If people switched, drivers would earn more, riders would pay less. But how do people switch? There's this moat, the network effect, that keeps people locked into the big companies. How do we escape the moat? Well, we build a bridge, right? I think Satoshi invented such a bridge. I call it Satoshi's bridge. It's called proof of work. It rewards the early adopters. Instead of everyone needing to switch all at once, the first people to switch get rewarded more than the people who switch later. It works. It has worked for Bitcoin. We're all here because it works. Every 10 minutes, Bitcoin issues a uh, you know, new Bitcoin token to the people who contribute the most work. Those who were mined early when few other people were mining were able to get a larger share of the network. TRIP is doing pretty much the same thing. We call it proof of revenue, which means the hard part about rideshare is bringing riders and drivers to the network, also to a smaller degree, operators, verifiers. So what we do is, every week, we look at who brought revenue to the network, and then, or rather the network does this, on an automated contract, it hands network rewards to the drivers, riders, and the people who invited them, proportional to their contribution to the network. So how do we take all of this, and you can read about this on trip.dev, and we'll release a lot more material on this. How do we launch this? Well, every city that launches needs to have at least one local rideshare operator. That's the entity that matches drivers and riders, and it will run on software that we're going to open source. Uh, it needs licenses, it needs insurance, it needs compliance with all the local regulation. 
And then it needs an atomic network. That means one driver does not make a good rideshare experience. There's a minimum amount of drivers you need in a market, depending on population density and a few other factors. And of course, there's no market without supply and demand, so you also need riders. So what we're going to do is launch a global competition between all the cities where we already have operators and allow them to compete with which city launches first. So the equivalent here will be, if your city launches first, then you will be able to drive, ride, invite people who drive and ride, and earn network rewards almost exclusively until someone else manages in their own city to get enough people to launch this. So the plan really here is not to launch a rideshare company or a rideshare protocol. Our vision for this is quite simply, this is the rideshare protocol, and in the future, ride-sharing is going to run on the rideshare protocol. There might be additional protocols in the future, like the food delivery or a more generic transportation protocol, and that's it. Drivers earn more, riders pay less, and early adopters get rewarded. Once we have enough people in a city, the city turns on, and the city can participate in the network. Uh, this is Teleport and the Rideshare Protocol. We have a lot of people here. You can talk to us after the presentation. We have an app right now in the iOS App Store with the Android app coming. And we have an active community on Telegram that you can join from the app or from our website, where you can coordinate with other people to take the Rideshare Protocol live in your city. Thank you so much. I'm pumped to be here. And uh, yeah, thank you for all the support.